Hi, my name is Beth and I'm a programming coordinator for the St. John's County Public Library System. Today is Indigenous Peoples Day and to celebrate, um, I'm going to share an excerpt of an interview that I conducted last year with Dr. Timothy Johnson, Distinguished Professor of Religion at Flagler College, where he discusses a very rare Spanish Chumuqua text um, known as the Pareja text. When the Spanish arrived to what is now um, known as St. Augustine, um, this site had been occupied by humans for more than 3,000 years. The people who the Spanish encountered when they arrived in 1565 are collectively known today as the Tumuqua. Um, they did not call themselves Tumuqua, that was actually the language that they spoke, but that's what we know them as today. Um, the Tumuqua lived over 19,000 miles um, throughout Central Florida, Northeast Florida, and even parts of Georgia. And there was more than 200,000 Tumuqua here when um, the Spanish got here in 1565. So um, Dr. Johnson is going to discuss how the Franciscan friar Pareja um, co-authored with unnamed Tumuqua authors um, this religious text that shares, that has both of their languages in the text, and we'll learn a little bit um, about the context of how they collaborated together. I'm about to meet with Dr. Timothy Johnson. He is the Distinguished Professor of Religion at Flagler College, and he recently discovered a Spanish Chamuqua book um, that was written by the Franciscan friar Francisco Pareja. Um, it was published in Mexico in 1628. It was previously unknown to scholars and was basically hiding in plain sight at a library um, at Oxford University. The native language of most of uh, the northern Florida area in the um, Spanish colonial period was Tumuqua. Um, when the Franciscans came in the 16th century, they began learning the language and um, teaching the indigenous people here how to read and write. So, To put this Pareja text into a little context, this work was a collaboration made between these Franciscan friars who had um, just arrived and the Tumuqua people who long lived here. Unfortunately, the Tumuqua were eventually devastated by the effects of disease, slavery, and war. And while there was likely still some descendants alive today, the Tumuqua as a people no longer exist, and the language is unfortunately no longer spoken. So, finding a Tumuqua text is extremely rare. This is a very important discovery and um, will help future scholars um, in untold ways. So I'm very excited to meet with Dr. Johnson and um, let's just go ahead and, and go learn a little bit more about this Pareja text. Uh, there is a renaissance going on here in Florida with regards to history, archaeology, religion, language, and what is um, really uh, a driving force for me too is working with my students because as I start to translate some of these texts I then give them to my students in English and, and we talk about them and not only are they um, appreciative of the content per se but to think that this actually came from here where, where they grew up that this is that this is part of your cultural heritage which is someone who lives in St. Augustine and and it brings to light among many things the fact that we used to think that um, the priests were really smart, and of course they were really smart. Uh, some of the smartest uh, actually were the first people to come to Florida. These were highly dedicated, highly educated men who were really willing to go um, on a dangerous mission. Uh, Florida was, was not well known. They came here, yes, intelligent, but we had this, or maybe just some of us had this idea that priests are really smart, they learn the Indian language, whatever it is, then they take whatever they have and then they put it into the Indian language. What we've been able to, to discover now is, is, is the phenomena of native indigenous writers. What that means is, when the friars came, uh, they didn't obviously know Tumuco, the Tumuco didn't know uh, Spanish. There might have been incidences of maybe someone who had washed ashore and had been taken captive, or maybe have some background, but essentially they, they didn't know each other's languages. So how do you start? You typically start with children. 
and, and you start talking with children and start to develop a, a word list of, of words. This means this, this means that. And those of, of people, those of you who know um, another language or studied another language realize that it's always much more uh, easy and less intimidating to study a language with children because when they laugh at you uh, with your pronunciation, it's much different than uh, when an adult, adult laughs at you. So, so this is the process, getting to know uh, each other, getting to know each other's words. And, but what happens then is the Tumukwa uh, then uh, are given a written language. And what I mean by that, the Franciscans would listen and then they would ascribe letters to what they heard. So very quickly there emerges a Tumukwa language a language that the Spanish believe is essential for them to evangelize, to catechize. They wanted uh, new converts to be able to read um, the books about doctrines, the prayer books. Uh, so language becomes really important on both sides. But what we ultimately see then is that someone like Francisco Pareja, who probably gets in here to Florida 1595, starts working with priests and um, Tumupo were already here, Wale Indians probably as well. And they start putting together these little documents, written lists, maybe questions, all on parchment. And when it gets to the native language, Tumupo, now that they have letters, the Spanish like Perea would give something to his Tumupo co-editors and they would put it into Tumupo. And it's not that they have a precise statement in Spanish that then the Tumukwa put into their language as a precise repetition of the Spanish, we actually see variety. We see how sometimes the Tumukwa expand on the idea. Sometimes they change the idea. Sometimes they have figures um, that appear in their stories that they use uh, but are not in the Spanish. There's all kinds of examples. Uh, one that I've come across quite often is the Spanish uh, prefer, often in, insist on speaking of the devil as a serpent. It goes back to the Christian interpretation of Genesis. But when the Spanish use um, serpente for the devil, when the Tumukwa take that text, they never use the word snake. And they Clearly in the text, they do not equate a snake with evil. So it's, it's pretty fascinating because time and time again, they simply do not use the snake image. Now, if you're a Franciscan sitting down with your Tumukwa editor, you know that he has not put the Tumukwa word for snake in there because anyone in uh, Florida, Franciscan, uh, who's been working here is gonna know the word for snake. So they, they look and they see that it's not there. What, what are they doing then in this case? What they're doing is negotiating. The, the, the importance of the text is not that it contains the word snake. The importance is the lesson, the greater lesson about sin, conversion. So they negotiate and they, they say, well, clearly for them, that word is not gonna work and it will not be accepted in their culture because you can imagine um, snakes have both good and bad sides uh, to them. They're not like a symbol of total evil. Sometimes they're a, a blessing, sometimes they're a curse, but they're not identified with the devil. So here we see how we have indigenous authors who are not just copying, not just reciting, but actually the, the technical term is glossing. Sometimes they'll gloss the story, they'll add something to it. Another great example is um, when they do uh, the uh, study in one of the catechisms of creation, the Tumuco authors use Florida animals in a hierarchy to show what their creation story would look like if they were referring to their own animals. So we see right here that that is a, quite a change, quite a change, and the Franciscans know that that's happening because they would know those basic words too, but they're giving um, the editorial control and development to their co-editors. So assuming these uh, texts start to be uh, published in 1612, typically there would be years of work leading up to that where the language is acquired, 
word lists are written up, and then uh, written notes are compiled to the point where you can then finally break that and compose a book. Thank you so much for joining us today. If you are interested in viewing the entire interview with Dr. Johnson, the link for the original interview is um, in the description below. Also, if you are interested in learning more about Tamuqua history, um, archaeological finds with Tamuqua, um, or even just early um, St. Augustine history, um, the St. John's County Public Library System has all kinds of resources in our system. Um, you can view our catalog, www.sjcpls.org, or just ask anyone at your local library. Thank you for learning a little bit more about our local indigenous history, and I hope you have a wonderful day.